All right. Joshua, you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me um, to your monthly meeting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, a robust discussion today. I um, get to meet some new folks and also see some familiar faces. I see uh, <laughs> Pat De La Quill, who um, I've worked with on HB 2021 issues, and, and he probably knows as much or more as I do. So uh, looking forward to a really great discussion after um, this presentation, which I'll try to keep um, to a half hour so that there is a, a good amount of time for discussion. So probably a lot of you know that the Oregon legislature passed HB 2021 in 2021. Um, that's the 100% clean law, which requires our investor-owned utilities, um, Pacific Core and PGE, as well as our electricity service suppliers to meet uh, clean energy targets over the next 17 years, 80% clean energy by 2030, 90% by 2035, and then 100% clean energy from our investor and utilities to retail Oregon customers by 2040. Now, it, I would say it was a challenge to pass that legislation, and there were some many, there were many, many months of intensive negotiations that went on in order to get that landmark bill passed. Um, lots of stakeholders involved, obviously climate advocates, uh, land advocates, thinking about the siting repercussions, labor um, stakeholders, thinking about what the labor standards would be and all of this new build out of renewable resources, community groups, thinking about how communities would be um, impacted, benefited, um, and so, a very long and arduous process to get to that kind of holy land of passing HB 2021. However, what I will say is that we now have a, a similar or even greater challenge in implementing HB 2021 because the legislature essentially gave us a mandate um, with you know a few specifics, but not too many specifics. And then they directed our state public utility commission and our state department of environmental equality to actually figure out how to guide uh, the, the utilities in meeting those targets. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. What's gone on over the past basically year um, at the PUC and DEQ by way of, you know, starting to implement this bill and um, beginning this long 17 year trajectory towards the 100% target. But first I'll tell you a little bit about Climate Solutions. We are a 501c3 climate advocacy group working in Washington state and Oregon. Um, so we're PNW focused. And our mission is to accelerate clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. We execute that mission by focusing on the three primary sectors where most of the emissions in Washington and Oregon come from. So that's transportation buildings and the electricity sector. Um, so we hone in on those three sectors. You know, there are certainly emissions from agriculture and landfills and, and other sources, but we're uh, really focused on transportation buildings and electricity. And my role uh, in particular is focused on electricity. Um, just to, kind of, just to kind of set the context here, I'm sure that I don't have to tell you all um, that we're, we are moving deeper into a climate crisis. Just in the past week or two, we saw uh, record temperatures in the United States, unprecedented flooding on the East Coast. We saw the effects of Canadian wildfires on not just our Northeastern cities, but on cities Further in the heartland, like Chicago, which had at one point, I think, the worst air quality index on the planet. Um, sorry about that. This is disrupting our weather patterns, disrupting the land base, disrupting our economic structures, our social structures. And importantly, we know that those who have contributed the least to the climate crisis are experiencing the worst effects both here in the united states in terms of frontline and marginalized communities as well as communities abroad island communities 
um, coastal communities in places like South and Southeast Asia. So we know that we're becoming more entrenched and deeper into this crisis. Oops. Um, so this is a um, what they call a, a wedge graph for thinking about how kind of broadly speaking, how Oregon as a state is moving towards decarbonization. So each of these wedges represents a different policy that has been passed or enacted or promulgated uh, in Oregon uh, with a specific focus in decarbonization. So you can see there's clean fuels, um, clean cars, uh, landfills, energy efficiency standards. Um, but you can see that the two uppermost wedges are, are pretty significant in terms of their GHG reduction potential. So you have the blue one, HB 2021, which I'll be discussing, uh, and then the um, Climate Protection Program, the CPP. Um, and so you can, I, I, I like this slide because it shows you just how important HB 2021 is to our decarbonization efforts as a state. By the way, please feel free to stop me um, and ask questions at any time. Uh, Joshua, mm -hmm. could, could you tell us what the CAFE federal standards are? So the CAFE federal standards, I believe, are the um, fuel economy standards that have been around for quite a long time, several decades, but they generally get more ambitious over time. So the federal government will require increasingly stringent fuel economy standards um, for cars with combustion engines. Sometimes you get a president um, like our last one who doesn't like this very much, but generally <laughs> the idea is that they would become more stringent over time. Thank you. So HB 2021 has a few key components. The first one that I referenced earlier and this is really the foundation of the law, um, are the targets, the clean energy targets. Now, when we think about these clean energy targets, one of the things that's important is that HB 2021 is a little bit different from the RPS, our Renewable Portfolio Standard, because HB 2021 is technology agnostic. So they talk about, in the, in the statutory language, they talk about non-emitting electricity, and the definition of non-emitting electricity is electricity that's produced by not emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So that means that hydropower is a non-emitting uh, uh, source of electricity. It means that arguably uh, nuclear power could be a non-emitting source of electricity if it doesn't emit GHG um, G greenhouse gases. Um, it could mean that if all of the emissions uh, from generating electricity are captured and stored that, you know, maybe that's not um, greenhouse gas emitting electricity. So it's a little bit, I would say, more uh, forgiving than the RPS standard because the RPS standard actually stipulates certain types of renewable technologies. So as I said, uh, the two investor and utilities, Pacific Core and PGE, as well as the electricity service suppliers are required to meet these targets, 80% by 2030, 90% by 2035, and then 100% by 2040. The legislature also included in the bill funding and the amount of $50 million for community scale renewable energy projects, um, because they had this certain amount of foresight in thinking that in order to really benefit the state and think about some of those equity considerations and community considerations. They didn't just want the IOUs to be building out utility scale projects in which you know, the, the, uh, the benefits and the profits would flow to for-profit companies, but they wanted to also be fostering what we call CBREs, community scale renewable energy projects or community-based renewable energy projects. Um, and so the first round of grants for that went out last year, and um, it looks like that program is going to be really successful in helping to foster some of those community projects. Another really important piece is that HB 2021 has very um, strong labor standards, and those were really hard fought 
in the negotiations of the bill. So all of the projects, all of the renewable energy projects that are going to provide our clean electricity um, either need to have um, a project labor agreement, a PLA, um, or they need to have, I believe, prevailing union wages. Um, and so there are some very good labor standards in place. So what I want to talk about, as I mentioned, <clears throat> is that this implementation phase that we're in right now. So another core component of HB 2021, um, you know, so I'll step back and say, you know, HB 2021 is really, um, the, the implementation of it is really through planning. There isn't uh, an enforcement mechanism per se for HB 2021. So the, the, the Public Utility Commission, the commissioners haven't said, you know, if you miss a target, we're gonna levy fines on you, PGE or Pacificor, um, at least not yet. And it's something that they probably have authority to do, existing authority to do, but they've said that they really want to kind of go through this process, this planning and implementation process kind of hand in hand with the utilities and provide them guidance um, rather than having a kind of top-down regulatory approach. So the one of the key uh, pieces of HB 2021 are these clean energy plans, which basically uh, are developed alongside the integrated resource plans. Integrated resource plans um, have been, is a mechanism that we've had for decades where Every two years, a utility will look out over a 20 year planning horizon and think about the different resources that it needs um, to, to meet demand in the least cost, least risk way. And so now we have, in addition to the considerations of least cost and least risk in thinking about energy resources, we also have this um, GHG reduction requirement as well. So you can kind of think of it as a third prong and that's what the clean energy plans um, aim to accomplish. So PGE filed its first clean energy plan in March and Pacific Corps filed its first at the end of May. Electricity service suppliers, which just to give you an idea of um, what they're kind of responsible for in the, in the energy mix in Oregon, they're like about 5%. They deliver about 5% of electricity in the state, whereas the IOUs deliver about maybe a little less than two thirds of all the electricity in the state. So the ESSs are quite small. Nonetheless, it is important that they're included in the bill because they do uh, uh, deliver electricity by wheeling it across the IOU lines. Um, so it's important to include them as well, but because they're so small and responsible for a pretty narrow amount of, of energy delivered, we, we've said that instead of the full planning process and the clean energy plans, the ESSs will just file basic, basic reports. So over the last year, the PUC has held workshops to inform a roadmap for implementation. Um, a few important pieces of that roadmap that became solidified through several PUC orders over the last few months, um, thinking a little bit more about the annual goals um, that the IOUs uh, want to meet. So I'll show you in a, in a few slides um, the pathways, or I think PGE calls it the glide path for carbon reduction. So you can kind of see like the annual goals they have at every year for, for how they want to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, their metrics for impacts, so how they're measuring the resources they're procuring, the, um, and how those are low carbon and how they're going to meet these targets. GHD reporting and verification, which is within the domain of the Department of Environmental Quality, which is tasked with um, receiving that reporting and verifying those greenhouse gas reduction metrics. Uh, continual progress, um, which is a really important part of the bill. So even though these targets are, you know, on five-year intervals starting in 2030, the legislature has said, we want to see continual progress. So we don't want, we the legislature don't want the utilities to be backloading all of your greenhouse gas emissions. Don't run your thermal plants, you know, for the next decade and then say, oh my gosh, we got to meet these targets. And then suddenly you're stuck. No, they want to see a linear 
reduction. They want to see continual progress year on year. So that's important as well. Um, acknowledgement, CEP acknowledgement. So acknowledgement is a um, kind of a term of art within the Pub Public Utility Commission. It means that when historically it has meant that when a utility delivers an integrated resource plan to the commission, the commission must formally acknowledge it. And they may not do that right away because um, acknowledgement triggers then a number of different processes uh, within the commission. So they may ask for more information. They may send out um, you know, some questions. Um, there's a period of public comment where the, co the public can weigh in um, on those initial IRPs. So because that process is in place for IRPs, we now need to figure out, okay, how are we going to formally acknowledge CEPs? Because that's a new type of document. That's in the roadmap as well. Um, and then annual updates um, on progress. So as I said, uh, these uh, the PGE and PAC CEPs came out in the last few months. A few key differences that I noticed, Pacific Core um, in its preferred portfolio um, has included SMRs, small modular reactors. Those are kind of small nuclear reactors. It's a new emerging type of technology. Um, that's a little bit different. Um, certainly PGE does not have small nuclear in its portfolio. Um, Pacific Core also because, you know, I think Pacific Core is a little bit different than PGE because it's what we call multi-jurisdictional. So, so Pacific Core works in several different states um, and they do still have coal plants in some of those states. PGE no longer has any coal plants, but Pacific Core does. So something that's a little bit different about Pacific Core is they're thinking about um, transitioning their coal plants to gas um, in the interim. Now, eventually they would phase out thermals altogether. They'd phase out fossil fuel plants altogether. But in this kind of interim period, they're thinking about, well, gas is um, a lot lower emitting than coal. So as we you know, kind of transition these resources, can we turn some of those coal plants into gas, plant, gas plants before we ultimately phase them out? That's a little bit different. Um, another thing that struck me is that PGE, and I'm going to talk about um, a require, the requirement in HP 2021 regarding small-scale renewable resources. Um, PGE has a really ambitious, I think, approach to procuring small-scale resources. Um, they, their model, when they ran everything through the model, you know, with all the policies and all the demand needs, um, their model basically told them, buy as much small-scale as you can. And the reason for that is because even though it may not be cost effective in the near term to buy small scale, because they do tend to be like on a per megawatt basis, a little bit more expensive, the bringing in those small scale resources early in the process and this you know, trajectory towards 2040 will ultimately give them a hedge against you know, if there's a resource gap in the future. Um, so it actually really makes um, both financial and strategic sense to be procuring those small-scale renewable energy resources. Um, this is uh, these are an example of what they call the um, PG calls the glide path, or um, Pat calls the emission pathway. One of the things that's a little bit challenging about reading the Pacific Core and PGE clean energy plans is that they don't use the same style um, in their in kind of their approach and their language and their um, their uh, graphs. And so these are sort of a little bit apples to oranges. But on the upper left here is uh, Pacific Core's uh, emissions reduction pathway. And I kind of like this one because it shows you um, you can see on the left all those thermal resources and how they sort of phase out over time going towards. 2040. So you can see that coal to gas conversion in the dark, kind of dark yellow or beige color. Um, you can see that kind of being reduced over time as they go from coal to gas and then ultimately shutter those plants. And then the, at the top, you can see where they're hitting targets um, along the lines of phasing out those thermals. So here they're actually saying that they're going to hit 2030 a little bit early 
Um, and then, uh, and then 2035, they're going to hit that 90% a little bit early. And then it looks like they're going to hit a hundred percent right at 2040. And I think that tracks with what we've been hearing from the utilities. They've said that they feel very confident based on their modeling, um, that they can get to that 90% reduction in 2035 with existing resources, but that the, but that likely there will be there they'll need to have they'll need to be procuring some emerging technologies like things like offshore wind or hydrogen or um, pump storage or things you know kind of those more emerging technologies in order to get them over the hump past the ninety percent and to the hundred percent and then on the bottom right um, you have a PG PGE's glide paths and these are a few different scenarios you can see. That kind of where it sticks out on the right, that's the what they're calling the um, front-loaded. I oh, know the front-loaded reductions is on the left in the gray, um, where they take some actions where, so that they get early greenhouse gas reductions. And then that one that sticks out on the right and the kind of turquoise is a back-loaded reduction um, where they uh, take those actions a little bit later. Ultimately, though, still getting and this one. This graph apparently only goes to 2035, but um, but all of these glide paths will get them ostensibly to that 2035 goal. So I just wanted to kind of show you these because I think they're interesting to look at and, and give a little bit of insight into how the utilities kind of do this modeling. Um, the other thing that I think is important to note that's happening right now is just getting kicked off is a process for interpreting some lingering statutory interpretation issues. When we went through this roadmap process over the last year, something that surfaced that a lot of people became aware of was that stakeholders have different opinions about how to interpret some of the elements and provisions of HB 2021. Um, and so staff decided to kind of refer that to the PUC's hearing division and have an administrative law judge preside over a hearing so they can just kind of hammer out those issues of statutory interpretation. So this is like a quasi-judicial process. You have these administrative law judges who work for the Public Utility Commission um, and they decide legal issues like this. So some of the issues that we're going to be deciding that are, I would say, relatively contentious are, what is the effect of the policy provisions in HB 2021? So if you've ever read a statute, you may have seen at the top of the statute, it'll say, it is the policy of the state of Oregon, or it is the intent of the state of Oregon. And there are these sort of broad statements about the values of our state. Um, and it's sort of unclear what what effect in law those statements have because they're not specific ma legal mandates, but they are important. So for example, they say things like, um, it's the policy of the state of Oregon that we consult with tribes, um, with tribal communities when we think about siting and development um, of renewable facilities. Um, it's the policy of the state of Oregon uh, that we think about the benefits that will inure to communities through the execution of this law. Um, you know, in terms of like, what are the jobs that are going to come to communities and what are the, what are the other economic benefits that are going to come to communities? Um, there's a policy statement that says it's the intent of the state of Oregon that, um, that the execution of this law not further burden environmental justice communities. And in fact, that the law actually uh, resolve some of the um, historical inequities um, in our electricity sector, where um, communities of color, indigenous communities, frontline communities have borne the brunt of some of the health impacts of burning fossil fuels, um, but at the same time haven't, um, haven't substantially uh, had any of the benefits. So these are important issues to think about. What do those policy provisions mean? Um, I mentioned continual progress before. We're going to think really hard about um, 
what does that actually mean, continual progress? Does it mean progress year on year? Does it mean progress every few years? What, if anything, can the um, Public Utility Commission do to enforce continual progress? Um, is there um, is there anything they can do, you know, in terms of like a stick rather than a carrot um, to say, well, you haven't, you utility haven't made progress, so you need to pay a fine um, or you need to go through some other process. So that's important to you. There's a provision that talks about that uh, HB 2021 should be executed in the public interest. What does the public interest mean? That's a pretty broad term um, that encompasses a lot of different kinds of interest. And then finally, we have to think about um, unfortunately, for some of us who <laughs> are very confused by this topic, but we have to think about how renewable energy certificates um, function under this law. So renewable energy certificates are essentially an accounting mechanism for receiving the benefit of renewable energy that's produced somewhere else that accounts for dirty energy that, um, that's generated here. Uh, and so it, it, it's an accounting mechanism, kind of a one for one accounting mechanism. The issue here is that um, a lot of folks say that uh, HB 2021 is what we call it a generation based law, a regulatory framework, meaning that we're only looking at the, um, uh, the, the energy that's being produced physically. Um, and how uh, emissions reductions are happening from that generation. So they say it wouldn't matter to have an accounting mechanism because we're literally producing the energy, counting the megawatts and the emissions associated. Um, and so it's just a physical, um, physical look at that. Whereas other folks say that it's a low, what we call a load-based statute, um, where it's not, you're not looking at the generation, you're looking at how the electricity is flowing and being delivered. And so, and so then you you do have to have some accounting um, because you know you could be delivering to other states and to other customers, and you have to basically um, account for the greenhouse gas emissions as part of like a larger load. Those are really complicated issues, but um, but they're important. Let's see how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Um, I mentioned the small scale renewable energy target earlier. HB 2021 mandates that the utilities meet 10% small scale renewables. So, so 10% of their portfolio has to be small scale renewables. Um, I believe the threshold is 20 megawatts. So anything under 20 megawatts would be considered small scale. As I mentioned before, PGE, their modeling says buy as much as you can. So it looks like at least at this early stage that they are on a good track to meeting that 10% goal. Um, Pacific Core, I think we're a little bit more concerned about. At the last presentation that Pacific Core did, they said they have a cluster study where they look at different clusters um, of small scale renewables, you know, based on where the transmission is. Um, those projects could be clustered in order to interconnect into transmission. And they don't even have enough applicants like in the study to fill the 10 percent goal um and certainly you know not every applicant in the study would qualify um that's the purpose of the study to you know see which which projects actually would qualify so we're a little bit concerned about um the number of applicants that are kind of flowing into pacific core system for small scales i think the other thing to note is you know, there are some barriers to entry for small scale renewables like Pacific Core. I don't know if this is an industry standard or not, but Pacific Core requires a bidding fee um, to bid as a um, as a small scale renewable project. Um, and they require that those projects put up security. It's like a certain uh, amount of money per kilowatt of energy produced. Um, and so, you know, there there are significant financial commitments just in bringing a project online, not to mention all of the other capital costs of building out a small scale renewable project. So I'm hoping that Pacific Core can kind of provide some 
technical help to some of those projects, but they've been a little bit resistant to that so far. One thing to note is that um, there was a rulemaking at the uh, Energy Facility Siting Council, um, which is was mandated by HB 2021 because they had to figure out what to what to do about existing or new fossil fuel plants. Long story short, you there can still be continued operation of fossil fuel plants, but they have to. Um, they can't have any emissions being emitted in, into the atmosphere. And so if it's a thermal plant, essentially that means they have to do carbon capture. Um, HB 2021 only regulates electricity, retail electricity delivered to Oregon customers. So there is a world where, you know, a scenario where PG or Pacificor could keep running a gas plant um, and deliver the energy produced by that, you know, out of state or to non PG or PAC customers. So I think a lot of people kind of think of HB 2021 as like covering everything, but it, it really doesn't. Um, it's only two thirds of, of electricity in the state. Um, equity is a really, really big part of this, as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the policy statement. So IOUs are required to consider um, how they can procure from community-based renewable energy when they when they do their integrated resource plans. I mentioned the $50 million in community renewable energy grants that includes tribes as well. Uh, the utilities also have to look at, develop and track community benefit indicators that look at whether communities are becoming res more resilient, whether health metrics are improving, um, energy equity, which includes things like energy burden, which is the amount of um, income that a person has to spend on on, on energy um, and then the economic impacts as well and they also form these utility community benefits and impacts advisory groups so that they can hear directly from communities which is an important piece as well so that's all i have um thank you for um letting me talk to you and i'm looking forward to a discussion well, uh Joshua, there are, I, I noticed some uh, chat, chats uh, with questions. Can you see those? I, I can read it off if, if uh, you can't read it yourself. Sorry about that, I was muted. I do see them. Isn't rooftop a very large potential resource for small scale? Yeah, I, I um, think that's absolutely right, Ed. Uh, you know, all of this discussion is focused on sort of more utility scale resources generally, but distributed generation like rooftop, I think is really important. Um, and I, I'm concerned that, you know, in California, they, um, they've reduced the, the feed-in tariff, I think, if I remember correctly, for um, for that net metering thing where you can um, push yeah. into the grid and also receive from the grid. And I, I worry yeah. that we're that we're watering down, you know, net re metering um, and disincentivizing rooftop because I agree with you. I think that's a really important piece. Well. Rooftop is one of the easiest ways to get very local um, what it, um, reliability. And given that we have all sorts of ways of, of losing uh, major sources of power, it seems that the uh, rooftop and um, local batteries, power walls, are in which uh, Australia got excellent use of as virtual uh, generators. Yeah, absolutely. Whole host of, of benefits. You know, you're supporting local businesses um, that are providing and installing rooftop. You get more resilience. Um, uh, you don't have to deal with like interconnections, except I guess you have to interconnect to your transmission line, but. Um, but yeah, I agree with that. The other thing I think is important to uh, look out for that may be coming soon are microgrids. 
um, which are these uh, group kind of uh, little clusters of solar, generally solar generation plus batteries um, that can operate in island, what they call island mode, not connected to a grid, or they can connect to a grid. Um, and those are really great for small communities and also provide that resilience benefit. Yeah, Michael Michael Mitten had a had a, a chat question there. Yeah, last month, Governor Kotek and some of Oregon's congressional delegation have requested that Boeing pause their offshore wind energy approval process. Do you think Oregon can meet HP 2021 100% by 2040 goal with in-state generation without this resource? Developers think it has a chilling effect on their plans. So, um, one thing I'll one thing I'll just say is we're not going to just have in-state generation. I think there is uh, some language in HB 2021 kind of indicating a preference for resources that are built in Oregon, but certainly we will have some out-of-state resources. I know that Pacific Core, um, I think NPG and E are going to be relying heavily on. Um, wind from Wyoming, um, but this question, this is a this is a really good question about whether we can get to that hundred percent. And particularly, as I referenced earlier, you know, the modeling the utilities are doing showing, okay, yeah, ninety percent, we think that's doable. That last ten percent, getting over the hump, that's tricky. And so I think that's really an outstanding question. If we don't get that you know, around three megawatts, sorry, three gigawatts potentially of offshore wind, what's going to replace that in the portfolios? And that's tough, you know, certainly having that wind resource um, would give us an enormous boost. Um, I think the other thing to think about too is we're not just meeting, um, not just needing to meet current demand with all renewable resources, we're having to meet increasing demand. So we're looking at, we're seeing like industrial loads increasing. We know there's a lot of data centers that are in Oregon and are coming into Oregon. Um, in Pacific Corps, uh, um, IRP, they said they're looking at a 60% load increase from industry by 20. 30 and an 80% increase by 2035. So we're looking at huge load increases. Um, and then we're also looking at electrification of our buildings and transportation sectors. So, you know, I think, you know, thinking about your question more broadly, um, we need a lot of energy and an increasing amount of energy and we need it to be clean. And it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough to find those resources. Michael, yeah. you can looks like you are in the system. Yeah, and also, um, you know, we do have the, the resource out there. Uh, NREL has said it's one of the best offshore wind resources in the world, and it would be a shame to have to import uh, Wyoming wind when we have our own wind and could have the jobs here. And a wind that is uh, more reliable over uh, ups and downs of, of time. Yeah, that's a good point. The complementarity with uh, offshore wind and and uh, other renewables is quite good. Uh, okay, uh, Joshua, uh, I haven't heard you mention natural gas, uh, Northwest Natural. Was that were they involved at all in the development of this? No, no. So. Um, so gas providers, fuel uh, providers like, like Northwest Natural are not covered by HB 2021. They are covered by the, um, the climate, uh, the CPP, um, the climate, climate protection claim. Why can't I remember the climate protection program? Um, but not by HB 2021. Um, I see Pat has his hand up. Yeah, uh, Joshua, thanks for the great presentation. Um, I just wanted to say something with regards to the REC issue, you know, the renewable energy credit issue and, and how that gets accounted. 
you know, historically, you know, RECs were designed to create niche markets for solar and wind in particular and, and other smaller scale renewables and new generation in particular. And so only a particular set of technologies were qualified to, each, to, to, to generate RECs and um, they actually, you know, they were successful. These RPS or renewable portfolio standard laws were one of the ways that we increased market share and capacity for building solar modules. And so the costs have come down to the point where solar and wind are now the cheapest resources on the market. And so moving to a you know, more technology neutral emission based standard makes sense. It no longer disadvantages solar and wind. But the the whole issue of load based versus generation based standard you know unfortunately is a is a legal rat hole which confuses a lot of people and and from my perspective um it's very simple in the sense that you know, what HB 2021 says is that the electricity delivered to Oregon customers must have the emission characteristics of the generating source and and so what how, how do you signify the emission reduction or the 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 environmental attribute that emission reduction attribute from that solar or wind plant it's through a rec now for existing hydro and and even nuclear that could qualify here they they don't have an accounting mechanism and so I, you know the puc has to wrestle with this issue of how do they account for assuring that the electricity delivered to Oregon customers really is zero emissions. And the rec for solar and wind signifies that. And if the utilities were to sell it, then they're selling that environmental attribute. And so it no longer qualifies as emitting electricity. And so again, I know that this, there's a lot of legal arguments about whether it's load or generation and you know, we're looking, you know, the Green Energy Institute is looking into the legal details of how the statute supports load based in some phrases and supports generation based in other portions. And how do you how you try to resolve that? But I think it's important to keep in mind the fundamental issue here is that if you separate the environmental attribute, it no longer qualifies as clean electricity. So that, that's my 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 addition for that. Thank you, Pat, for explaining that far better than I could. <laughs> um, it looks like there's a, another question here. Uh, oh, there's a couple, a couple of questions. Um, one from Jane. Uh, Jane's a Pack Power customer Blue Sky, um, which is their I think their green tower program where you can choose choose renewable electricity. Um, how can I? How can I put pressure on them to move faster on this? I don't see them doing enough. When you say, um, Jane, when you say put pressure on them to move faster, to expand the blue sky program, or do you mean move faster um, in terms of their progress on the on HB 2021? Oh, uh, on HB 2021, yeah. Mm. Uh, at some point, I think we're gonna have to see how many blue sky customers they have and how many kilowatts they use, because I'm not so sure that it's as blue as they contend that it is given how much coal and gas that they actually use for generation. Um, but um, Portland General Electric just seems to be much farther ahead than Pacific Power. And I, you know, we need both of those electric utilities to be doing as much as they possibly can to get in line with 2021 as soon as possible. So any suggestions for consumers to put pressure on their utility companies? It's a great question. I mean, I'll, others probably could answer this better than me, but I would say you're a customer of theirs and companies tend to value their customers. So um, there are many, um, you know, processes 
uh, at the PUC that you could write a comment on, you know, write a comment letter. Um, and I would start every single one of them with, I am a Pacific Core customer, and this is what I want. <laughs> Uh, because it seems to me that there is some there is some power in in um, being a customer. Uh, Joshua, I assume that uh, Climate Solutions is going to be continuing to uh, be active in with HB twenty twenty one, and uh, uh, our organization uh, will also be interested in that as well. Metro Climate Action Team. Uh, what, what what do you see as uh, future activities by uh, advocacy groups like ours? Yeah, great question. So uh, Pat um, is very active in our energy advocates group, which is our sort of coalition of stakeholders. Um, and so you are you have already. You have already done us a great service in sending Pat to us, who's, I would say, an invaluable um, member of that coalition. Um, so, you know, looking towards the future, um, the there's a kind of like pre pretty elongated process for the clean energy plans. Um, we just we just had what they call round zero comments, and the reason they're called round zero comments is because there are three rounds of um, where it, in this kind of iterative process where the utilities like submit their IRPC, B, get the comments from stakeholders and the commission staff, go back, make changes, same thing happens two more times. So that's like months long, um, a months long process. So we'll be doing that for a while. Um, and then we'll be going through this, um, this case for a while on, on statutory interpretation that I mentioned. So that's another big thing um, that we'll be doing. Um, I think those are kind of the, the main things that we're working on. You know, um, the other thing that's really important for us at Climate Solutions is that we figure out ways to expand these clean energy targets beyond just the utilities. So I, I mentioned data centers earlier and data centers are, are some of, if not the biggest consumers of energy in the state. Um, Climate Solutions worked on a bill this last session that would have actually um, put the same clean energy targets, the exact same clean energy targets from HB 2021 on data centers. That bill did not pass. Um, but we're still thinking about, you know, this other part of the state, mostly in rural rural Eastern Oregon, um, where we really, you know, aside from the RPS, we really don't have any restrictions um, or any kind of like pathway to decarbonization. So that's another big piece too that I'm, I'm sure Pat is thinking about and Pat has his hand raised. Thank you, thank you. And Ed, I think you had one more comment here. Yes. I. Joshua, the one thing that, that you didn't mention is that there is a coordination group for following HB 2021 implementation that meets Thursday mornings at 9 o'clock, um, 9 a.m. And um, I think people are welcome to join that. If you want to learn what's going on, we are following um, both IRPs as well as the, the docket that you mentioned on the rules update, um, as, as well as the, the DEQ um rulemaking with regards to some of the uh, clean protection plan uh, uh you know rules as well so um yeah so that's something if someone is really interested um you don't have to be a technical expert to be engaged and you can get onto groups that are going to comment on the irps in particular i think we had good success with a coalition that we formed to intervene in the Northwest Natural IRP. So we were able to, you know, ask questions and get answers to details and things like that, that, that you can't as the general public. Um, so again, uh, you know, if you have some technical expertise or just want to get engaged and dig in, um, you know, that's a good place to start. Well, and, um, 
yeah, I was while I was looking, I was distracted. I was looking for who's just taken over organizing that. It's uh, the new person at um, NWEC, I believe. Do you remember the name? Yeah, um, so that's Alma Pinto. Alma Pinto, yes, it's Alma, Northwest right. Northwest Energy you. Coalition, yeah. Well, Joshua has uh, can talk to us no later than one o'clock, and we're almost out of time here. Uh, is there any other uh, question that really, really would like to have answered? Because Joshua has uh, other commitments here coming up. Uh, well, hearing uh, uh, no questions, uh, Joshua, thank you so much for putting this together and talking to us. It's been a, a really informative to me and it helped me uh, planning new actions here myself. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure to be with you. Have, have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay.